Every year, approximately 600,000 people go missing. A large majority of these cases are resolved within a year, but many of them are left unsolved with families questioning their loved one's whereabouts. Sometimes these mysteries are figured out many years down the line, but sometimes they're never figured out at all. This is the Disturbing Disappearances Iceberg Explained. Hey Mangos, how's everyone doing today? I hope you're doing great. great My name great. is Joel X and I'm uh, here to bring you some mysteries. I'm not exactly a part of the Scooby gang, but I definitely get my fair share of Scooby snacks in. In this video, we're covering the unexplained slash disturbed disappearances iceberg made by our friend from Reddit, Old TH Race. This chart has eight tiers and there's a bunch of names that I recognize and there is a bunch of names that I don't. We're going to split this video into four separate parts doing two tiers at a time. So let's dive right in. Tier one. Amelia Earhart is a name that I'm sure many of you recognize. She was born in Atchison, Kansas on July 24th of 1897, and throughout her younger years, she played basketball and briefly attended college. During World War I, she served as an aide to a Red Cross nurse in Toronto, Canada, and she became interested in aviation. After the war, she came back to the United States and went to college at the Columbia University in New York. Soon, she would take her first plane ride in California and become absolutely enamored. Kind of like me every time I see food. But this prompted her to make aviation her entire life. Amelia passed her flight test in December of 1921. And then by 1922, she set her first record by being the first woman to fly solo above 14,000 feet. Then 10 years later, in 1932, she became the first woman and second person to fly solo across the Atlantic Ocean. Because of this, the United States Congress awarded her the Distinguished Flying Cross, which is a military decoration that people get for here heroism, or an extraordinary achievement while flying. She was also the first woman to receive this award. In that same year, she also made the first solo non-stop flight across the United States as a woman. And I know I just said as a woman a lot, but she, she set a lot of records, okay? So on June 1st of 1937, Amelia and her friend and also navigator Fred Noonan set off to become the first pilots to circumnavigate the globe. This was the second time that Amelia was going to attempt this flight. 28 days later, on June 29th, the pair reached Ley, New Guinea, and only had 7,000 miles left in their path. Soon they would depart from Ley to go to Tiny Howland Island to refuel, and this was the last time that they were ever seen. President Franklin D. Roosevelt put out a massive search party that lasted for two weeks, but they were never found. Many theories and speculations exist about what happened to the pair, but uh, nobody really knows. D.B. Cooper on November 24th of 1971, a man that went by the name of Dan Cooper walked up to the Northwest Orient Airlines in Portland, Oregon and bought a one-way ticket on flight number 30 to Seattle, Washington. Soon after the flight took off, Dan handed one of the flight attendants a note that said that he had a bomb in his briefcase and that he wanted her to sit with him. So she sat down and then he showed her a briefcase with red wires and a bunch of sticks that looked like dynamite. He made her write down on a piece of paper that he wanted four parachutes and $200,000 in $20 bills or that he was going to set the bomb off. Soon the flight would land in Seattle and an exchange was made. Dan Cooper traded the 36 passengers that were on board for the money and the parachutes. The plane would soon take off again with Dan and a bunch of the crew members and they went on route to Mexico City. Sometime a little after 8 p.m., Dan took the money and a parachute and just jumped out of the back of the plane and he hasn't been seen since. Nobody has any idea who he really was and this is still heavily regarded as one of the biggest mysteries of all time. What do you think? happened to him. Here's what I think happened to him. I think he took that money, lived a really good life, because I would have done the same shit. Madeline McCann. Madeline McCann was born on May 12th of 2003. Nine days before her fourth birthday on May 3rd of 2007, she disappeared from the hotel room that her and her family were staying at. Her mother Kate and her father Gary took Maddie and her two-year-old twin siblings on vacation in Praia da Luz in Portugal. Praia da Luz means beach of light. On May 3rd, during breakfast, Maddie had asked her parents, why didn't you come when me and my brother cried last night? For some reason, the parents didn't take that notion seriously. I'm not too sure why. That same 
same night, Kate and Gary went to have dinner with friends at the Tapas restaurant at around 8.30 p.m. Why on earth would you leave a three-year-old and two-year-old twin siblings alone? They are two and three. Why? But they said that they checked on the kids multiple times throughout dinner, and at around 10 p.m., Kate noticed that Maddie was missing. Many theories speculate about what happened to her, but nothing has ever came from it. There's been a few suspects, including the parents, but nobody has ever been charged. And once again, why on earth would you leave a two-year-old and a three-year-old alone? The Mary Celeste. The Mary Celeste was an American merchant Brigantine. On November 7th of 1872, the ship set sail for Genoa, Italy from the New York Harbor. There were eight crew members, the captain, Benjamin S. Briggs, his wife, Sarah, and their two-year-old daughter, Sophia. Approximately a month later, on December 5th, a British ship named the Die Grata saw the Mary Celeste at full sail floating adrift around 400 miles east of the Azores. No signs of any of the crew members or the captain and his family were ever seen since. That is so terrifying. Just disappearing from a boat? My goodness. The ship was missing a lifeboat and had several feet of water in the hold, but other than that, it was undamaged and it still had six months left of food and water in it. The Mary Celeste was originally named the Amazon, but was changed after the death of the first captain and after it collided with another ship. How spooky. But it's commonly referred to as the ghost ship. Dorothy Arnold. Born on July 1st of 1885 in New York, New York, was a woman by the name of Dorothy Arnold. Dorothy was the daughter of Mary Parks Arnold and Francis R. Arnold, and they were extremely wealthy, basically as wealthy as you can get. They were considered to be on par with that of the Rothschilds family or the Rockefellers, if you know who they are, and that's really saying something. Basically, they were stupid fucking rich. Also, her uncle Rufus W. Peckham was a U.S. Supreme Court justice. On December 12th of 1910, between noon and about about 2 p.m., Dorothy vanished and was never seen again. She left her house super dressed up, and she told her mom that she was going to buy an evening gown on Fifth Avenue. But apparently, she made a couple detours. She was seen buying candy, and then afterwards leaving a bookstore by her friend Gladys King. Nothing has ever came from this, and nobody truly knows what happened, though many investigations were conducted. How does somebody who's worth so much money not have, like, bodyguards or some kind of protection or something? But this is where she was last seen. Eileen Moore Island. On December 26th of 1900, Captain James Harvey was in charge of a ship that was carrying supplies and a man named Joseph Moore, who was a replacement lighthouse keeper. Basically, Joseph was going to relieve one of the lighthouse keepers on the island. The three men that were on the island were named Thomas Marshall, James Ducat, and William MacArthur. When the ship pulled up to the island, the captain was surprised that nobody was waiting for him, and so he honked the horn a couple times and shot a flare up in the air to try to get the men's attention. Nobody ever came. So Joseph Moore went to check on the men and he instantly realized that something was wrong. The door to the lighthouse had been unlocked and it looked like something bad had taken place. In the kitchen was half-eaten food and an overturned chair, making it look like somebody had to jump out of their seat in a hurry. And also, the clock was just stopped. What truly happened to these men is a mystery, and the only thing that was left behind is a couple weird lighthouse log entries. On December 12th, Thomas wrote that severe winds with the likes of which he had never seen before in 20 years were occurring. He also stated that James was very quiet and that Williams had been crying. Then on December 13th, another log entry said that the storm was still raging and that the men had been praying. And on December 15th, a final log entry that read, Storm ended, sea calm, God is over all, was created. What on earth does that mean? What's also weird is that they were 150 feet above sea level during this, and apparently there were no storms reported in the area during this time. So, where did they go? Jimmy Hoffa. Jimmy Hoffa was born on February 14th of 1913 in Brazil, Indiana in the United States. Leaving school at the age of 14, he then worked as a stock boy and warehouseman for a long time. In 1940, he became the chairman of the Central States Drivers Council and then two years later became president of the Michigan Conference of Teamsters. The Teamsters is the largest private sector labor union in the United States and they represent truck drivers and people in similar industries. Ten years later, in 1952, he was elected to become an international vice president of the Teamsters. Then five years later, in 1957, he became international president of the company. He helped the Teamsters become the biggest labor union and was considered a key role in many decisions. On July 30th of 1975, Jimmy disappeared from a restaurant in Detroit. He was said to have had an appointment with Anthony Provenzano, a New Jersey's Teamsters official and former figure of the mafia, and Anthony Gaiasalone, a Detroit mobster. They both denied ever having met with Jimmy, and he hasn't been seen since. New information released in 20 
2020 by a man named Frank Coppola said he knows exactly what happened. He said that his father, Paul Coppola, revealed to him exactly what happened to Jimmy while Paul was dying in 2008. He said that Jimmy's body was delivered to the old PJP landfill and placed in a steel drum and buried with other barrels, bricks, and dirt. In November of 2021, a news article was released saying they're looking at the landfill now, so hopefully something comes of it. Also, the FBI looked in this exact landfill during this time, but apparently they didn't find anything, so I don't really know. Benjamin Bathurst. In 1809, traveling through Europe was extremely dangerous due to many countries declaring war on each other. Benjamin Bathurst was a British diplomat that was traveling through Europe under the name Baron de Koch. He was accompanied by an attendant named Herr Krauss, who was using the name Fisher. On November 25th of 1809, the two arrived at the city of Pearlburg. Benjamin then requested that fresh horses be obtained for his chase. Soon, they would check in at the White Swan Inn and have some dinner. Afterwards, Benjamin went to a small room where he spent hours writing correspondence correspondence and burning paper for some reason. At 9 p.m., Benjamin was told that the new horses are ready and that they could leave whenever. Benjamin was the first to leave the inn and he was followed closely by Hare. Someone stated they noticed that Benjamin, instead of going into the chase from the side closest to the inn, he walked towards the front of the horses in order to go around them and get into the chase on the far side. Hare followed right after him. As soon as he reached the far side, there were zero signs of Benjamin anywhere. He just mysteriously vanished. The only clues to ever come up was that on two days later, on November November 27th, Benjamin's coat was found in the outhouse of a local family named the Schmitz. And on December 16th, two women found Benjamin's pants. The pants had two bullet holes in them, but no blood stains. So this means that Benjamin took his pants off and somebody shot them with a gun. Why? Raoul Wallenberg. Raoul Wallenberg was a Swedish architect, businessman, diplomat, and humanitarian. Damn. Is there anything that this man couldn't do? He was born on August 4th of 1912 in Ladingo, Sweden. During the 1930s, he was studying in the United States and was soon recruited by the U.S. War Refugee Board in June of 1944. He was given status as a diplomat by the Swedish legation and his task was to do what he could to assist and save Hungarian Jews. Raoul soon arrived in Budapest, which is the capital of Hungary, on July 9th of 1944. Even though he lacked any experience in what he was doing, he somehow led one of the most successful rescue efforts during the Holocaust. On January 17th of 1945, the Red Army took over Budapest and Raoul was last seen with Soviet officials. Nobody knows what truly happened, but it's expected that he was killed on July 17th of 1947 while imprisoned by Soviet authorities at the Lubyanka prison in Moscow. In October of 2016, 71 years after his initial disappearance, Swedish officials decided to legally declare him dead. Malaysia Airlines Flight 370. On March 8th of 2014, Malaysia Airlines Flight 370 was carrying 227 passengers and 12 crew members when they disappeared without a trace. The flight was scheduled to leave Kuala Lumpur and land in Beijing. The airplane took off at 12.41 a.m. local time and by 1.01 reached a cruising altitude of 35,000 feet. At 1.21, the plane's transponder switched off just as they were about to enter the Vietnamese airspace. At 2.15, the Malaysian military detected an unidentified object on its radar traveling West. The radar target is thought to be Flight 370, and then the plane disappeared from military radar about 200 miles off the coast of the Malaysian state of Penang. The plane was scheduled to arrive in Beijing at 6.30, but never came. And then at 8.11, a satellite detected the last signal from the plane's antenna. For weeks, there was a huge search party, but nothing ever came from it. That was until July 29th of 2015, when the first confirmed debris were found on Reunion Island in the Indian Ocean. Throughout the next two years, more fragments of the plane were found found in various different islands. And then on January 17th of 2017, the search for Flight 370 was suspended. Tier 2. Virginia Dare slash Roanoke Colony. Virginia Dare was born on August 18th of 1587 at Roanoke Island in Colonial Virginia, which is present-day North Carolina. Virginia was the first English-born child in the Americas, and she was the daughter of Ananias and Eleanor Dare. Ananias served as one of the 12 members on the board of directors in Roanoke Colony. Her father was the governor, John White. The reason that Virginia was given her name was to signify that she was the first English-born child in Virginia. Nine days after she was born, the governor, John White, would set sail for England to get more supplies 
supplies and more colonists. When the governor finally reached England, King Philip II of Spain and his fleet of warships attacked the British. Due to this, the governor was not able to return to Roanoke for three years. As soon as he arrived back to Roanoke Island on August 18th of 1590, which was Virginia's third birthday, he discovered that the colony had been completely abandoned. The only clues that they would find is in a logbook that was kept by the governor, and he said he found the letters C-R-O carved in a tree by the water. And on the right side entrance of the colony, the word Croatoan was carved on a post. Tons of speculation about what happened to the people is theorized, but Governor White hoped that they were all safe with Manteo and his Croatoan tribesmen on their home in the Hatteras Islands. Solomon Northup Solomon Northup was an African-American farmer and musician who had been taken hostage and sold into slavery in 1841. While looking for a job in March, he met up with two men who said that they were affiliated with a circus. He only intended to go to New York with them and play some violin music in the background of their show, but somehow they convinced him to go to Washington, D.C. It was there that they drugged him and severely beat him and sold him into slavery in Louisiana. He was then sold to a man named Edwin Epps who lived in the Bayou Bayouf in 1843. Bayou Bayouf. I, I I think I think that's how you say it. For years he endured horrible conditions, that of which nobody should ever have to go through. In 1852, a man named Samuel Bass, who was an anti-slavery Canadian, visited the Bayouf plantation. He became friends with Solomon, and Solomon told him what happened, so Samuel decided to reach out to Solomon's old friends and see if that was actually true. Then a lawyer by the name of Henry B. Northup, who was a friend of Solomon's and the grandnephew of the person who had manumitted Mintus, helped Solomon legally obtain his freedom on January 4th of 1853. That same year, Solomon published the memoir 12 Years a Slave and it became a top seller and helped to aid the abolitionist cause. For a while he was giving lectures and working with the Underground Railroad to help people in slavery get to Canada. He randomly disappeared from public life and people estimate that he died around 1863. It's weird because nobody knows what actually happened to him after this time or when he died. Mount Nyangani Disappearances Mount Nyangani is the highest mountain in Zimbabwe at 2,592 meters. It's located within the Nyanga National Park in the Nyanga district. And the Manyika people that live there believe that the mountain is a sacred highland place and that an evil spirit resides there and that's who's responsible for the mysterious disappearances. In 1981, two teenage daughters of a former government official named Tikain Depi Messiah disappeared on the mountain. A huge search party was set out for them, but nothing ever came from it. Then a few years later, a 12-year-old schoolboy named Robert Ackhurst was on a school field trip when he wandered off and completely disappeared. His teacher was actually so upset set by this that he ended up committing the following year after Robert's disappearance. There were many more disappearances that followed Robert's, but one of the most recent ones is in the case of 31-year-old Zaid Dada, who was a Zimbabwean tourist. On January 4th of 2014, him, his wife, and another couple went on a hike up the mountain. After they got about halfway up, everyone in the group except for Zaid got tired, so Zaid decided to wander off and look at the scenery. Soon, his wife and the couple would become a bit worried because Zaid hadn't returned yet, and so they decided to look for him. They couldn't find him, and so a huge huge search effort was made, but nothing ever came from it. Maybe the mountain really does have an evil spiritual presence. The Lost Sandringhams The Sandringham Company is a group of soldiers that were taken from the royal estates of Sandringham in the United Kingdom. Founded by a man named Edward VII, the group included gamekeepers, gardeners, farmhands, and household servants. The group was run by Frank Beck, who was a middle-aged man. On August 12th of 1915, during the carnage of the Gallipoli campaign in World War I, all of these soldiers mysteriously disappeared. One of the chiefs of the Gallipoli campaign, Sir Ian Hamilton, said that in the course of the fight, there happened a very mysterious thing. The men charged into the forest and were lost to sight and sound. Something weird, though, is that a soldier by the name of Sidney Poole, who was present at the scene, said that there was no trees or any forest for them to disappear into. So, where did they go? Ambrose Bierce. Ambrose Bierce was a story writer and an American Civil War veteran born on June 24th of 1842. He had many books become very well known and his book The Devil's Dictionary was even named as one of the 100 greatest masterpieces of American literature. At the age of 71, Ambrose crossed over into Mexico to join the Pancho's Villas Revolutionaries. He wrote a letter to his niece Laura that said, Goodbye. If you hear of me being stood up against a Mexican stone wall and shot to rags, please know that I think this is a pretty good way to depart this life. It beats old age, disease, or falling down the cellar stairs. To be a gringo in Mexico, ah, uh, that is euthanasia. Then right before he entered Mexico, he wrote to Laura again and said, I shall not be here long enough to hear from you and don't know where I shall be next. Guess it doesn't matter much. Adios.
Ambrose. The final letter was dated December 26th of 1913 and was postmarked Chihuahua. In it, he expected to leave the following day to go to Ojinaga, which is where Villa was supposed to attack a cornered federal army. Many investigations and theories about what happened to Ambrose circulate the world. This has even inspired novels such as The Old Gringo by Carlos Fuentes. Bela Kiss. Bela Kiss is a Hungarian serial killer who was said to have murdered 23 women and one man. He was born on July 28th of 1877 in Hungary and during his younger years, he was said to have been very fond of the occult. Bela had gotten married twice and had two children. For a while, people had noticed that Bela was collecting metal drums on his property. The police asked him about this, and he said that he was just collecting gasoline to prepare for rationing in the upcoming war. In 1914, World War I began, and Bela was drafted into it. Two years later, the landlord of Bela found a bunch of the metal drums, and he decided to try to open them, only to be hit with a terrible odor. He then got the police to open the drums, and they found 20 23 women and one man. Police found that the bodies had puncture marks on their necks and they were drained of blood. This made them believe that Bela was practicing vampirism. On October 4th of 1916, Bela was seen working in a Serbian hospital and so they sent the authorities there, but by the time they got there, a dead man was already in his bed. It's thought that he faked his death by exchanging identities with a dead soldier named Makari, but nobody really knows. And vampirism? What? Nefertiti. Nefertiti was the queen of the 18th dynasty of ancient Egypt and the great royal wife of the pharaoh Akhenaten. It's believed that she was born around 1370 BC and raised in the town of Akhmem. She then married Amenhotep IV, who was the son of Amenhotep III, who was known as Amenhotep the Magnificent, and he was the ninth pharaoh of the 18th dynasty. Around 1353 BC, Amenhotep IV took the throne, and him and Nefertiti began making great change to the Egyptian society. They made Aten, a sun god, the main focus of their religion. During the fifth year of their reign, Amen Amenhotep IV changed his name to Akenhaten, which translates to the living spirit of Aten. He really liked the sun god. But in the 12th year, Nefertiti's name was nowhere to be found. Many people believe that she died from a plague, but a lot of theories debunk this. Some people believe that she actually dressed up as a man and took over the throne, but nobody really knows. What happened to the queen? The name Jane Battalion. On that, it said Nanking, like on the iceberg chart, and it also says Nanking too, if you look it up. I don't know if it's Nanjing Jane or Nanking. I have no idea. On December 10th of 1939, during the Second Sino-Japanese War, 2,988 Chinese soldiers were assigned to defend a bridge on the Yangtze River. But by the next morning, the entire battalion completely disappeared. The commander of that battalion's name was Li Fu Xian, and he was a colonel that was ordered to defend Nanjing Hills. He saw that the troops were well dug in for the night and that he had soldiers on the watchtowers, so he decided to go to sleep about two miles away. The next morning, he was frantically awoken by one of the eight Aides, who told him that none of the troops were responding to calls or any of the signals. They come to find that all of the troops had completely abandoned their position. No signs of a struggle existed, and all of the heavy weapons were still in their place, ready to be fired. No soldiers were found besides a handful of troops that were stationed on a bridge and in the watchtower. The men had been questioned, but they had no idea. They said that nobody slipped in through the night, and they heard zero signs of any combat, and they had no idea where their soldiers went. It's incredibly unlikely that the Chinese warriors just gave up and surrendered to the Japanese because something like that would have been seen. Some theories speculate that they were abducted by aliens. Some theories speculate they just walked away. I think it was aliens. Agatha Christie missing for 11 days. Agatha Christie was born on September 5th of 1890 in Torquay, Devon, Southwest England to a very well-off middle-class family. She was mainly homeschooled by her father and her mom didn't want her to read until she was eight. Till she was eight? But because Agatha was a bit bored, she decided to teach herself to read at the age of five. In 1912, she met a man named Archie Christie, who was a qualified aviator, and two years later, in 1914, they got married. During World War I, she turned to writing detective stories, and her first debut novel was published titled The Mysterious Affair at Stiles. Then, in 1919, on August 5th, Agatha gave birth to her only child, Rosalind. That same year, a publisher named John Lane accepted The Mysterious Affair at Stiles for publication and contracted Agatha to produce five more books. In 1928, her and Archie would divorce, and the next year she would meet a 25-year-old archaeologist in training named Max Malomen, who would later become her second husband. She would continue writing for years through a bunch of highs and lows and eventually slow down a little bit. But there was one strange thing about her life that left many people puzzled. When she disappeared for 11 days. On Friday, December 3rd of 1926, at around 9.30 p.m., Agatha Christie kissed her sleeping daughter Rosalind goodbye and left in her Morris 
Crowley and drove off into the night. For 11 days, nobody knew where she was. Over 1,000 policemen were assigned to this case with hundreds of civilians, and for the first time ever, they used aeroplanes. The cops located her car abandoned on a steep slope at the Newlands Corner near Guildford, but zero signs of Agatha were spotted. Days later, on December 14th, she was found safe and well at a hotel in Harrogate. She was unable to provide any context clues about what happened to her. Nothing has ever came from this, and nobody knows exactly why she disappeared. Some theories speculate that it's because she was trying to get attention to promote a book sale or something, but maybe. Her husband believes that she suffered a total memory loss as a result of the accident, but when I was reading, I'm pretty sure there was no car accident, so I don't know what that was all about. A biographer named Andrew Norman said he believed she was in a fugue state or a psychogenic trance, a rare condition brought on by trauma or depression. But anyway, that'll do it for this episode. I just want to say thank you so much for watching, Mingos, because I really do appreciate it. If you enjoyed what you saw, then please consider subscribing and hitting the like button, and I'll see you next time. Okay, I wonder if I will go down under.